The Methodical Battle, Part 2. You can see here the French Fort Douaumont, which is one of the forts that was involved in the Battle of Verdun, the largest land battle in Western history. Early in the First World War, on September 26, 1915, 10,000 British soldiers, organized in 12 battalions in two separate British divisions, attacked German trenches near Luce, France. After a 20-minute bombardment and following a half-hour pause, the British advanced and were met at 1,500 yards from the German trenches with machine gun and artillery fire. In three and a half hours, 385 officers and 7,861 soldiers were killed. That is an 80% kill total. The Germans called it thereafter Das Leichenfeld von Luce, the field of corpses of Luce. You can see uh, the map on the uh, left side, and uh, you can see Luce between the purple and the green lines on the uh, yellow line, which is the front for the, uh, the Germans and the English. And you can see on the right side a set of still photographs showing British soldiers emerging out of a trench, and some were hit by uh, shots coming uh, downfield and were incapacitated and unable to leave the trench. The First World War battlefield with its machine guns, barbed wire and trenches, artillery, poison gas, aircraft and tanks was a very lethal environment. Therefore adopting the incorrect tactics in this environment was particularly fatal. You can see on the top left a German machine gun crew, on the top right a French machine gun group with gas masks, on the bottom left you can see a French howitzer in a trench, and you can see on the bottom right thick barbed wire. Uh, some of these types of barbed wire, which we call today concertina, actually have welded instead of the little barbs which are basically uh, a little wire with sharp ends that's tied around the wire you actually have razor blades that are welded and I've been caught in concertina and tried to escape and these razor blades will cut right through your clothing into your skin and I remember having an incredibly expensive army Gore-Tex jacket which I, I think sold for several hundred dollars like on the order of six hundred seven hundred dollars and I cut it to ribbons trying to get out of the concertina and concertina is also dangerous for vehicles uh, I once set up a very large uh, barbed wire and concertina fence and an armored vehicle a lav drove through it got the wheel caught in it and like a spool the wheel wound up all the barbed wire and the barbed wire with all the pickets in the ground those are the stakes that hold it in the ground pivoted the vehicle off the road and dragged it into a field despite the fact that it was going at a very high speed it could have flipped the vehicle in fact so not only does the barbed wire stop people it, it can enmesh vehicles now there is however a myth of the massacre of the first world war recall the clip i showed you from the gallipoli movie so there we have a myth that attackers would emerge from their trenchers, trenches and climb up the, the side of the trench on a ladder and come out into no man's land and be massacred uh, with ease by the defenders armed with machine guns. In fact, defenders suffered heavily as well. Not so much from machine guns, but from artillery that was constantly brought down on their positions. Because the defenders were obliged to come out from their bunkers to defend their line as the attacking infantry approached. In fact, artillery killed a lot more soldiers than machine guns. So you have to appreciate a more sophisticated, non-Hollywood version of what was happening in the trenches of the First World War. Uh, you can see here um, a machine gun crew, a British machine gun crew on the right. Uh, you can see on the left top the machines uh, uh, the, the rather that's a pockmark sorry it's the Messines Ridge blasted by artillery fire you can see the large uh, craters which are incorporated into the entrenchments and the bottom left is the pockmarked surface of the Battle of Ypres so just 
incredible artillery bombardment that has left large parts of northeast France scarred to this day. Not only physically, but uh, the chemical signature from the cordite and the explosives have uh, significantly damaged the terrain. Consequently, attrition has gained a bad reputation. Now, it's popularly assumed that if you go into battle with the willingness to suffer casualties, then you will needlessly uh, waste the lives uh, of a great number of soldiers. In fact, a survey of some battles of the First World War indicate that the defender often suffered as many losses as the attacker. So you look at the Battle of the Marne, uh, the Germans and the Allies suffered the same amount, whether it was attacker or defender. The Second Battle of Ypres, uh, the Allies suffered twice the losses. Battle of Artois, the French lost uh, a th about a third more losses than the Germans. And so on. Verdun, Arras, Nivelles, Messines, Passchendaele, Cambrai, Samlis, Ain. Uh, you don't have huge differences in the numbers of losses. Uh, uh, take note of the Battle of Verdun. I mean, 434,000 Germans and 542,000 French. The issue is that most of the bodies were never found. They were emulsified by the artillery uh, in the fields. And the Battle of the Somme uh, that occurred around the same time, that was an attempt by the British to relieve the pressure on the French. So there was a transition in warfare. The most important changes in how battles are fought for the last half millennium, which is largely an adaptation and a perfection of the use of gunpowder, were made during the First World War. In fact, the way we fight today is essentially defined by the last few months of the First World War. During the Napoleonic Wars, a century before the First World War, infantry soldiers were in large, tight formations, shoulder to shoulder, and could fire about twice a minute with a muzzle-loading musket out to about 100 yards, which is a range of a, of a football field. Artillery cannons were direct fire, and they had a line of sight that could be out to 1,000 yards, and so they were typically located on a small hill nearby. Cavalry was vulnerable and was mostly used to attack infantry and artillery after they were weakened. And you can see here, you've got British soldiers fighting at Waterloo, and what they've done is they formed a two-level square against oncoming French cavalry attacks. And it was quite rare for the cavalry to be able to overcome these uh, squares. And these squares were not thick. It was basically a line of three or four uh, soldiers uh, in, in a box formation. And these box could be penetrated if artillery could be brought to bear to put a hole in the box. But if the artillery couldn't get close enough, these boxes were essentially invulnerable to cavalry. So in the 99 years between the defeat of Napoleon in 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo and the First World War, which broke out in 1914, infantry formations were gradually loosened from shoulder to shoulder to far more dispersed single lines. So you'd have uh, lot waves uh, of, of infantry approaching rather than having them tightly packed marching. This was because of a new weapon, the breech loading rifle. So this meant you would load it from the rear and not from the front, which is a muzzle-loading weapon. And so you could fire up to six times a minute accurately out to 500 meters. And therefore, densely packed soldiers were going to get severely massacred. Uh, so you have an increase in the range from 100 meters out to five times that distance. At the, in the Battle uh, of, of, in the, rather, the, the, the War of 1812, which involved many battles on the Canadian frontier, if one group of 100 soldiers charged another group, the defenders would be able to fire two musket balls at each attacker before the attackers could close to bayonet range. Right, so that's over a distance of a football field. So you can run pretty fast across a football field, and you had a reasonable chance of avoiding those two musket balls. However, in 1912, if one group of 100 soldiers charged another group of 100 soldiers, the individual defender would be able to fire 200 rounds before the attackers could close to bayonet range. There was virtually no chance of being able to close. The odds were astronomically high that everyone who was running would be shot. Infantry were further equipped with machine guns, but in small numbers before the 
First World War. Artillery increased its range from 1,000 yards up to 10 kilometers, and they could fire indirectly, which means firing over hills against an enemy they couldn't see. Cavalry was relegated to reconnaissance and scouting because they had become a lot more vulnerable. You still had cavalry uh, in the Canadian Army in the 1920s. Uh, rather, officers were trained uh, to ride horses. Uh, uh, and you had cavalry units fighting during the Second World War. And you still have mounted units in different parts of the world, uh, often horses uh, with mule trains, or you have uh, Chinese uh, camels that um, patrol the Gobi Desert. So it's not uncommon, and horses are uh, much more intelligent, intelligent than, say, a jeep, and they can actually move in territory where a wheeled vehicle couldn't go. In 1899 and 1902, we have the Second Boer War in South Africa. Essentially, the uh, British invaded uh, the Orange Free State and the Transvaal. We have the Russo-Japanese War in the Far East in 1904-1905. And we have the First and Second Balkan Wars that occurred uh, involving Serbia, Bulgaria, um, uh, Romania, uh, uh, Greece, and uh, uh, what was then the collapsing Ottoman Empire. And in all of these, it was difficult for military observers to interpret uh, what was going on and what the implications for the future were. So in the 1904-1905 uh, uh, Russo-Japanese War, there were British observers because Britain was an ally of Japan. And so the British were on the battlefield observing the actions against the Russians. And they uh, saw that there was a, a shift in the impact that technology had on tactics. So they made three general observations. Number one, advancing frontally over open terrain would be difficult. And that's, that's basically an understatement. Um, uh, during the Crimean War in the 1850s, the British and French were able to advance against intense fire and occupy fortifications. Uh, but the Japanese suffered enormous casualties when they tried to do the same uh, against Russian positions at Port Arthur. Uh, which was a major uh, well-defended port that the Russians uh, held in the Far East. Number two, soldiers would have to disperse in order to survive. If you have a cluster of soldiers, it attracts fire. Uh, and area effect weapons, like a shell that explodes and sends out metal splinters or shrapnel, would uh, kill and injure many soldiers at the same time. So you'd have to have the soldiers spread out. Number three, digging trenches in the ground to escape artillery was important. It had a huge impact. I am an army engineer and I can tell you we spent a huge amount of time focusing on the creation of fortifications. One of the most powerful instruments even in the age of nuclear weapons is the shovel. If you have a trench in the ground and it's sufficiently deep uh, you're exposed to an overhead nuclear explosion but if you build overhead cover made of earth and it's only 12 inches deep like you throw down a plank and you throw earth you increase your survivability by 95% because a very high altitude nuclear burst loses a lot of the PSI uh, because it, to cover a higher area, it has to have a higher altitude. Uh, digging a trench is very annoying for the infantry because they have to do it every time they stop. But uh, the life-saving impact is huge. It's a very important part of discipline and training to get people to constantly dig into the earth. And the earth provides huge protection uh, increases. Uh, on the uh, right, you can see British rail artillery, and on the left, you can see a British machine gun crew. By January of 1915, during the First World War, after a failed German attempt to seize Paris, the First World War on the Western Front settled down on a continuous trench system that ran from the Swiss-French border all the way to the English Channel. There was simply no way of advancing um, without attacking an enemy trench system frontally. There's no, no exposed flank, a flank around which to, to push. So you can obviously see an explosion on the right from a shell. What you see on the left, uh, if you look carefully, is Verdun. Verdun's around the center of the map. Um, between It looks like a salient between a blue, a blue uh, army sign and a red army sign. And it's an area that the Germans wanted because it was a large railhead. And the Battle of the Somme is uh, basically the top left of the map where the British uh, were deployed. 
And ultimately, both of these battlefields would be involved during the uh, Verdun operations. Let's see if I can indicate it. Yeah, here we have. Here we have Verdun. And what the Germans want to do is drive through the salient right up to this river. So other fronts, uh, such as the Eastern Front against Russia, didn't have the same problems. There weren't the same challenges because there was a lot more open space and there simply were not enough soldiers, even for the Germans and the Russians, to dig a trench system that would run from the Black Sea all the way up to the Baltic. So maneuver was always a possibility and therefore cavalry had a much bigger role. Attacks using the tactics of the 19th century, of soldiers that were not very well dis uh, dispersed, such as uh, those I described at Luce in, in 1915, typically resulted in terrible losses and defeats. What was needed, therefore, were new tactics to solve two new problems. One, how to attack frontally without being slaughtered, right? Because there's just no possibility of a flanking attack. So if you attack frontally, how can it be done? And number two, how do you move on the battlefield, more, more basically, without being slaughtered when you're within a view of the enemy? Here you can see uh, French soldiers advancing under shell fire. So let's take a look at the first tactical problem. How to attack frontally without being slaughtered. 19th century tactics dictated that units break up into rows of skirmish lines and advance into rifle range of the enemy after a short supporting artillery bombardment by cannon with direct lines of sight. The artillery bombardment ceased to be useful once the troops had gone beyond visual range because friendly fire was a likely possibility. You didn't want to shell your own soldiers. Typically, the result was a massacre for both the infantry and the artillery. Now, we call it a skirmish line because even in ancient times when you had Greek phalanxes uh, or you had uh, Roman uh, cohorts that were pretty tightly organized of much light, light, lighter equipped soldiers uh, with slings uh, who would run around the battlefield screening the main force. In other words, they would chase away other skirmishers and make it easy for the main force to maneuver without being harassed um, or, or easily observed. So you can see on the top a German skirmish line advancing at the Battle of the Somme. So they're no longer shoulder to shoulder, but they're still uh, fairly compact. Uh, you can see French colonial soldiers in the bottom left, uh, obviously from Africa, at the Battle of Verdun. And you can see in the bottom right uh, French soldiers uh, advancing, and here they're lying on the ground and making use of the terrain. Now, there were three developments that helped break this deadlock. First, artillery was made indirect. Artillery was brought behind the rear of the infantry, so it would be less vulnerable. And this was a very quick development at the beginning of the First World War. Uh, you can see here a very large French rail gun on the right. That's a 400 millimeter rail gun. And you can see a smaller rail gun on the left. The second solution was that artillery was used to suppress the infantry by providing a preliminary bombardment that lasted about a week. And the goal here was to destroy the enemy trench systems, the machine guns and the artillery placed within that trench system. So here you can see a French soldier and a large unexploded German shell. You can see a French rail gun that was uh, operating at the Battle of Verdun on the top right. And the bottom of the right, you can see a large uh, stockpile of French artillery shells used at the Battle of Verdun. Now, this was followed by a creeping barrage. And this would be a, a wall of shelling that would advance just before the marching infantry and cover them until they got to the enemy trenches. These were usually prearranged and followed a very strict timetable to permit the artillery and the infantry to coordinate. Typically, it would advance at the speed that the infantry would be marching. The philosophy guiding this was that the artillery would do the killing and then the infantry would simply have to walk into empty trenches. This actually never happened uh, for the obvious reason, reason I mentioned before, which is that the earth and, and the, the spade or the shovel uh, can be used to provide a lot of security 
against shelling. So you just dig down a couple of feet and, and you can protect yourself against shelling. Uh, the statistics at the end of the First World War was that it took about a ton of explosives from shells to kill one individual. That's how much power uh, and protection you got from uh, basically playing with the earth and the stones around you to create protection. This is a barrage map for the Canadian Battle of Vimy Ridge in 1917, and each of those uh, vertical lines is a phase line associated with the time where the artillery would be shelling uh, deep in the rear, and the infantry would advance right behind that curtain of fire, right up into the uh, uh, trenches of the uh, enemy. Now the problem was that the effectiveness of artillery bombardment was uneven and digging was quite effective. So very often you'd have outposts that would be shelled and the shelling curtain would bypass without destroying those outposts. outposts. An example of a huge failure was at the Battle of the Somme, which is depicted in the uh, picture, the map rather, on the left. The British suffered in one day alone 19,000 killed. And this is the largest single daily loss in British military history on July 1st, 1916. Uh, though putting into perspective, uh, it's still less than the number of soldiers killed by the Carthaginian General Hannibal at the Battle of Cannae. On the right, you can see outside of Fort Vaux at Verdun, uh, the result of German shelling. This is a large stone and cement fortification, and you can see that it's been reduced by uh, intense shelling. The third solution was a week-long barrage, but it was realized that these gave warnings of the attack and led the enemy to move substantial reserves into the rear areas to halt any breakthrough from an advance. So the week-long barrages were cut down. Now, it took years to make the realization that shelling for a few hours was more effective in terms of immediate destruction of targets than shelling for a week, because it's so counterintuitive. So the effect of these timetable tactics was to produce a synergy between artillery and infantry. And to this was added poison gas. By the end of World War I, uh, about a fifth of all shells fired were gas shells. And you have the addition also of aircraft and other mechanical aids like tanks. These innovations required significant precision and coordination. The result was a very effective concentration of force by the end of the First World War. So let's take a look at the second tactical problem. How do you move on the battlefield without being slaughtered? Now, as I mentioned in a previous lecture, if you were to go to a flat football field and lie down, even a flat football field suddenly reveals to you that it's curved. There, there are virtually no non-professional fields that are completely flat. The zones that are in the, in the lower part of the field is called dead ground. And it's parts of the terrain that give some cover. And a good soldier would be able to maneuver between these low undulations and improve their survivability as they advanced on target, even if the land looks seemingly flat. So the complexity of the Earth's surface dramatically degrades the effectiveness of even modern firepower. Now, uh, the picture here is, of course, an exaggeration. These are, this is an undulation in a French forest caused by shelling from the First World War, and the, the, the trees are obviously a regrowth uh, a century later. On September 9th, 1914, two German brigades, the 43rd and the 44th, attacked Russian units at Gardauen, a city in East Prussia. This is during the First World War. The German commander of the 44th Brigade was concerned that the Russian machine guns, the artillery, and the rifles would disperse his unit, making it impossible for him to direct 
the movement of his brigade in battle, and therefore the brigade would be useless to the outcome of the attack. He was also worried that the intensity of the Russian fire would weaken the morale of his soldiers and separate the leaders from their subordinates. He therefore moved the unit to a small forest and then rushed his unit out, shoulder to shoulder, the 800 meters to attack the Russians. Now, the adjacent 43rd Brigade commander left the advance to his subordinates so they could take advantage of the cover in the ground but he required that there be a 5 to 10 meter distance between each wave of soldiers and that there be 300 meters between the subunits of the advancing brigade. And he told them to get within 300 meters of the enemy before they stopped and began to return fire. What was the difference? The 44th Brigade, which charged and did a rush from the forest, suffered 50% losses and fell back. Keeping the unit together in order to preserve morale and preserve the ability to command the unit was a mistake. The 43rd Brigade, which was told to disperse and to find its own way through the, the terrain in front of the Russian position, suffered only 2% losses and then in the subsequent firefight defeated the Russians and caused them to withdraw. Clearly, dispersal was the safer formation. But why then did the commanders so reluctantly adopt dispersal of their soldiers? Well, for several reasons. Number one, rural soldiers were usually, uh, rather rural people were usually better soldiers than urban recruits. People that grew up in the countryside were ethically more traditional, therefore more honor-bound not to desert or run away or shirk in combat. And they could more easily therefore adopt a warrior's code, which in turn gave them better morale. They were therefore more likely to be used as rifle skirmishers during the time of Napoleon, because you could rely on them not to run away. Uh, for example, the, the Germans used Jaggers as their skirmishers. Industrialization and urbanization had shifted the demography. In other, in other words, most of the population uh, lived in cities, and this is where recruits came from. And city dwellers in general were less uh, uh, familiar with hard labor, generally suffered worse health than people living in the rural areas, and uh, uh, were generally poorer soldiers as a consequence. Uh, in this picture, you can see no man's land around Verdun in 1916. So urban soldiers and the mass rural conscripts were seen as having fragile morale, especially on the intense modern battlefield with all their different kinds of weapons. It was believed that dispersed soldiers would lose their leaders, lose their discipline, then lose their courage, and then run from the battle. Uh, here you can see the vicious result of hand-to-hand -hand combat, where one group of soldiers ends up in a trench with another group of soldiers, and then they fight with bayonets, knives, uh, hammers, spades, and whatever else they can hit each other with. Now what the Germans discovered, and the British French did not, was that it was not in fact true that dispersing soldiers would undermine their morale. The origins of current techniques of warfare are found in this sociological revolution that was adopted to solve the trench deadlock of the First World War. So it was a social change, not a technological change. Squads of ten soldiers as a grouping had existed in the 19th century in most European armies, but they were organized as a shooting unit. In other words, everyone would fire at the same time. But they were not a maneuver unit. They're typically a part of a much larger formation, and they marched in whatever direction the entire formation was marching. Now, the Germans began experimenting with ten soldier units for maneuver. What that means is they would break that group of ten soldiers down into smaller groups, like two groups of five or three groups of three, and have them coordinate fire and support between each other. In other words, one group would move while two groups were firing to suppress the target. So they became a complex, interactive unit. German Captain Willy Martin Rohr 
experimented with the assault detachment, Sturm Abteilung, whose purpose was to facilitate offensive operations by devolving responsibility from the officer to non-commissioned leaders. Now, the French were the, were the first actually to experiment with this, but the Germans were first to ex implement the experiment on the battlefield. These young leaders were given the mission and told to navigate the ground, engage the enemy, and coordinate with local units on their own initiative. Maps were distributed to these young leaders. Uh, here you can see a French squad deploying for infiltration. Basically, they're crawling, not walking, and they have a variety of different weapons, including the Hotchkiss machine gun. Now, to understand the importance of this social revolution, in societies with traditional values, you have a power distance between the leaders and the followers. And many of the leaders in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe were monarchical. In other words, you had traditional uh, monarchies tracing their origins back to the uh, Middle Ages, uh, whose ethic was grounded on religion and the divine right of kings. Uh, even in Western Europe, like England and France, you had great power distances measured by tremendous differences in wealth between the aristocracy in England or the uh, industrial class in France and the factory laborers and the farmers. So this implied giving responsibility to those farmers and those laborers. And when responsibility is given, it cannot be taken back. And so at the conclusion of the First World War, you had a massive change of expectations. Uh, these soldiers uh, demanded the vote. They demanded more say in the economy and the foreign policy of their country. And it effectively um, destroyed the hierarchical class system. So this is truly a change in mindset and not a change in technology. So, Captain Rohr decentralized the conduct of operations and he replaced the extended skirmish line, which is what you can see here, with individual assault squads or Sturmtroops or Stas troops. And these were designed to maneuver independently in order to exploit terrain for cover. Now, experimentation led to the use of combined arms at lower and lower levels of command. Whereas at the beginning of the First World War, it was common to have an entire battalion of 500 soldiers armed with the exact same rifle, firing in the exact same direction. By the end of the war, a squad section of 10 soldiers could be expected to be armed with a collection of rifles, pistols, grenades, portable light machine guns, flamethrowers, grenade launchers, and carbines. Some specialized units brought with them a short 7.5 76.2 millimeter uh, portable artillery and even mortars. This meant soldiers had to master the technology of these different weapons. There was a certain amount of interoperability. They had to know how to use the weapons in coordination. They learned how to communicate to coordinate complex actions. And these operations were done in isolation from higher leadership. You had the, the section commander or the squad commander having to take control of the operation in isolation from direction from above. So on the top left you can see German rifles, um, you can see a German flamethrower team on the right, uh, you can see a French soldier in the center with a light machine gun, and a French portable 37mm cannon on the bottom left. So the new doctrines focused on these young leaders independently maneuvering their way across no man's land, making use of available terrain for cover and concealment. When they encountered enemy machine gun positions, they would use fire and movement. One portion of the squad would fire and suppress the machine gun position with its own machine guns, mortars, and grenade launchers, perhaps throwing smoke grenades. The enemy machine gun would thereby be distracted. The remainder of the squad would use a combination of grenades and flamethrowers to advance on the position and neutralize it. In this picture, you can see French soldiers after they recaptured Fort Douaumont in Verdun, 1916. And in the painting, you can see fighting going on inside Fort Vaux at Verdun in 1916. Imagine these giant fortifications with huge caverns being completely saturated with gas. Uh, it was unbelievable hell 
uh, for both the French and the Germans doing the fighting. So this came to be known as combined arms tactics. It permitted different weapons to be mixed together that complement each other. Heavier machine guns would provide suppressive fire, while light carbine armed soldiers can move more quickly and outflank the enemy. The logic is that combined arms tactics forces the enemy on a dilemma. Uh, and let, let's take, for example, a modern example. If you attack me with aircraft and tanks, I can either defend myself against tanks by going up against an embankment, which would make me vulnerable to air attacks, or go inside a forest where I have protection from the aircraft, but can't see the tanks attacking me at the same time. So in reality, I will defend myself by choosing a halfway solution that provides me bad protection or less than optimal protection for each of the aircraft and the tank. So the point with combined arms tactics is that the attack has to be simultaneous. If it's not, well, there's no dilemma. You can defend against the airplane and then defend against the tank. If you attack first with aircraft and then followed by tanks, uh, you're just going to cause the enemy to adopt their optimal defense against each in serial. Now you can see here uh, the German A7V tank and German fighter aircraft. So in contemporary warfare, combined arms tactics would include uh, tanks, uh, which you can see uh, chieftain tanks in the bottom left, mechanized infantry, uh, which are ac accompanying uh, those tanks, uh, self-propelled artillery, which you can see in the bottom right, anti-tank missile launchers, helicopters, fast aircraft, and engineers. The artillery is a, a French SP-155 millimeter. You've got a Soviet Hind Mi-24 attack helicopter, a Danish anti-tank missile system mounted on an armored vehicle, a US A-10 close air support aircraft, and a British FV-432 APC mechanized mine layer. And I am familiar with that towed mine laying device because I used it to lay mines in very rocky ground in British Columbia. So we have the development of new tactics. So it takes well-trained leaders and soldiers with a maturity and reliability thought unthinkable prior to the First World War. It was thought that if soldiers were dispersed this much, they would cower and not shoot back or run away. The Germans were the masters of this new form of democratic intelligent warfare. The French and the English were never quite able to master it as well as the Germans, who encouraged this level of decentralization and junior leadership. The first application was in the form of what are called Hutier tactics. Uh, German General Oskar von Hutier led the 8th Army attack against the Russians in the Riga Offensive starting on September 1st, 1917. And with exploiting elements, he broke into the Russian rear echelon. It was a highly successful attack and led to a dramatic Russian retreat. It was accompanied by a short explosive gas and smoke bombardment not a week long, followed by a closely coordinated and immediate infantry assault seeking to bypass frontline enemy positions. Uh, here you can see in the picture the firing of German mortars at Verdun. This was also applied subsequently at the Battle of Caporetto, which was a German-Austrian-Hungarian offensive in northern Italy on October 24th to November 2nd, 1917. Hootier tactics were used to smash the Italian front. 35 German divisions were deployed against 41 Italian divisions, and it resulted in 20,000 Austro-Hungarian and German losses versus 40,000 Italians killed and wounded and 275,000 prisoners. And it was won by bypassing the Italians and getting into their rear quickly before the reserves could be deployed, and then the Italians that were bypassed were isolated without supplies or munitions or food and eventually their ability to resist was reduced. Now the same tactics were tried again on the Western Front against the English and the French armies on March 18th to April 5th 1918 in the Marne Offensive. The German offensive was tactically successful because it captured large amounts of territory and it broke the deadlock. But casualties were very high and it was therefore a strategic failure. They were not able to break through the French and the English position. A German attempt to apply the same tactics during the July 15th to the 19th Second Battle of the Marne Offensive were disrupted by a preemptive Allied bombardment. 
So the results for March 21st, 1918, uh, which was uh, uh, a, a, a conquest of 140 square miles, was effectively only 10% of the losses of the Battle of the Somme for a much greater territorial conquest. And you can see the losses here. The Germans suffered um, more dead. They suffered more wounded uh, because it is indeed lethal to cross into enemy territory, but they captured enormous numbers of British prisoners that were trapped in the rear. All in all, uh, the losses are, are equivalent, just like uh, it was at the beginning of the First World War when you had groups of soldiers leaving their trenches and attacking other trenches. The attacker and the defender were evenly balanced for the most part in losses. The difference is that maneuver was restored. You could capture large bits of territory again for the first time. And so the, the apparent technological determinism of artillery machine guns and trenches and barbed wire was um, overcome. Now there were counter developments. The Germans developed a form of defense in response to the irresistible synergy of artillery and infantry attacks. Usually, French and British artillery would obliterate the Germans in the first and second trench lines. The Germans evolved an elastic defense in depth, uh, which forms the basis for all of today's defensive deployments. And it had three elements. Number one, instead of a front, front trench line, which was vulnerable to enemy artillery, there would be a series of strong points that would delay and provide warning of an attack but would actually encourage the French and the British to advance. Number two, as the enemy advanced deeper into German territory, the attack's momentum would slow as the infantry outmarched their artillery and supplies, and they entered new terrain where they were disoriented because they didn't have an opportunity to do reconnaissance. Number three, the Germans would then counterattack aggressively from an unexpected direction. This would first catch the attackers off guard and throw them back, and two, it would relieve the forward posts and thereby give them an incentive to hang on and not surrender. So what were the overall operational and strategic consequence of these change in tactics? By 1917, the basic tactics used in the Second World War were already established combined arms, and fire and movement. In the last seven months of the First World War, starting in 1918, maneuver was restored to the battlefield and armies. Armies left the trench to engage each other and never returned. Now, many of these tactics also play a role in facilitating maneuver warfare, but I would argue that this is more closely related to the methodical battle, where they're more commonly used, particularly combined arms. So no new conventional weapons included guided missiles and uh, uh, drones and the communications revolution and machine learning and lasers have counteracted these basic tactical innovations which are sociological. Only nuclear weapons might undermine their utility but I have to indicate that in a exercise run by the Soviets uh, using very large numbers of troops, but of course notional nuclear weapons effects uh, in the Carpathians in the 1950s and later in the 1960s, they actually uh, estimated that a nuclear weapons use on the battlefield would cause mobile armies to return to an element of trench warfare. But if those armies were significantly dispersed, uh, um, uh, they could actually have loss rates in response to nuclear weapons that wouldn't be significantly different than the more intense battles of the First World War. But it was expected that nuclear weapons would reduce mobility. But we don't know. Um, uh, there are reasons that nuclear weapons could also restore mobility by destroying strong points. Here you can see a French machine gun crew. Now it doesn't mean that there aren't continuing disputes over how the methodical battle is supposed to proceed. Typically these differences are over whether infantry should maneuver to close with the enemy to destroy them, as we saw with the Viet Minh against the French Dien Bien Phu, or the use of artillery to bombard an enemy to destruction. So let's take a look at an example of, the, of a controversy. This is the Battle of Saipan from June and July of 1944 during the Second World War in the Pacific Campaign 
uh, where the Americans were island hopping against Japanese possessions. So the U.S. Marines and the armies were both deployed on the island attacking the Japanese. The overall commander, U.S. Marine Corps Lieutenant General Holland Smith, also called Howling Mad Smith because he was always yelling at everybody, fired Army General Ralph Smith because of a difference in their tactics. Now, although the two Marine divisions were suffering greater losses than the U.S. Army, they were also advancing much more quickly than the Army. The U.S. Marine Corps preferred an infantry-reliant tactic of closing with the enemy, pushing the enemy into a dilemma, and then destroying them in close combat. This made it very difficult for the Japanese to withdraw or to maneuver, and so it resulted also in very high losses to the Japanese, and then the Marines could move forward in the battle. The U.S. Army preferred to proceed methodically, using artillery to flatten Japanese positions at a distance, because the U.S. Army had a lot more artillery than the Marines, and then move in with the infantry. And the idea here was that it saved a lot more lives. Now, this resulted in a U.S. Marine Corps Army feud over which method was more effective. Uh, the Marines arguing that uh, by being so close to the Japanese and inflicting much higher losses on the Japanese, um, that the U.S. Marine Corps would eventually clear the island and the, the battle would end. Where the Army was suffering uh, fewer losses per day, but because it would take so long for them to bombard the Japanese into oblivion, in the end, uh, their losses would probably be higher. Now, in this feud, uh, General MacArthur accused the U.S. Marine Corps of, of being wasteful in lives. The U.S. Marine Corps uh, won the dispute largely because uh, they believed in inflicting the greater losses on the enemy, and they had the support of the Navy, which wanted quick conquest of these islands. But it's a debate that uh, continues uh, to this day. Uh, the uh, U.S. Marine Corps has a gazette, a sort of a journal, and it includes tactical problems. And um, many of these tactical problems are actually uh, jibes at the Army, at the way the Marine Corps has a very different philosophy in how they conduct uh, um, uh, intense warfare. So we've been alluding to the Battle of Verdun, which occurred in 1916, repeatedly throughout this lecture. Associated with the Battle of the Somme, which was largely initiated to relieve pressure on the French, so the Battle of Verdun and the Battle of the Somme together can be seen as one uh, single action. Uh, together, they form the largest battle in the Western experience. Here you can see uh, Verdun. Call up a pointer here. So here you can see the town of Verdun, and it's uh, located on a river. And you can see here various rail lines that run through. And this is the center of a large salient. And Verdun is protected by hills that are here on the east. And you have a series of fortifications like Douaumont, Vaux, Fleury. And these were enormous facilities that were um, incredibly well constructed. I'll show you a couple of pictures in a moment. And so the Germans thought that if they could capture Verdun, they can then hold the line along the river, the Meuse, and reduce the total number of soldiers in this area and push the French out of their toehold on the east side of that river. So the Germans initiated the battle not to break through the trench system and attack the rear, but they designed this to achieve victory through attrition and exhaust the French. The battle took place over an area that is slightly larger than the distance between the Hall Building downtown and Loyola campus in NDG, uh, which is um, uh, about 10, 12 kilometers, a very small area um, for such an enormous battle. So the German plan uh, was formulated by German General Erich von Falkenhayn, shown here, and he believed that Germany must defeat France before Russia. And the strategy should therefore be, quote, bleed France's army to death, close quote, and, and ultimately into surrender. He continues, quote, to achieve that object, the uncertain method of a mass breakthrough, in any case beyond our means, is unnecessary, close quote. 
So he chose Verdun because it lay close to a German railhead, so it was convenient for the Germans to be able to resupply their attack. So the operational plan was to capture four out outer forts. Douaumont, uh, which had a height of around 1,200 feet, uh, Fort Vaux, Fort Tavannes, and Fort Noulinville, followed by Fort Souville, and then a further further three forts, Belleville, Saint-Michel, and Belle-Rupt, before reaching the city of so let's go through the dateline of this attack. On February 12, 1916, you have the largest concentration of artillery at this point in human history. 1,220 German guns fired 2.5 million shells over six days, concentrated at Verdun along an eight-mile front of the offensive. Utmost secrecy was preserved for the 140,000 attacking soldiers who were placed in concrete bunkers near the front. There was a diversionary German attack in the Champagne and the Flanders area to make the French think that was the true location of a bigger attack. On February 21st, 1916, the German offensive began at Verdun, and it was led by storm troops, these infiltrating Houthier tactic soldiers. The German bombardment lasted six hours from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. It cut communications lines and it cut the railroad to Verdun itself. You can see uh, the French General Pétain here on the left and you can see the German advance uh, over Fort Douaumont and Fort Vaux on the map in the darker purple band of the map. On February 25th, Fort Douaumont fell to the German pioneers. These are assault infantry. And it was the focus of the battle. And in the picture, you can see here the plan for Fort Douaumont. You can see an aerial photograph of Fort Douaumont in the top left before it was shelled. And you can see the incredible destruction inflicted on the surface of the earth by German artillery on Fort Douaumont. Now, the French plan was to commit to the defense of Verdun and not to abandon it. General Pétain declared, quote, they shall not pass, ils passeront pas. And this was in all the newspapers. You might have recalled uh, J.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings in The Fellowship of the Ring, where Gandalf says this to the Balrog, the great demon, you shall not pass. Tolkien was a young English soldier in the trenches and he participated in the Somme offensive that the British initiated to take the pressure off of the French at Verdun. And so that was a quote taken from every newspaper that, that soldiers saw where Pétain was quoted. Uh, uh, and he did this to stiffen the backs of the soldiers so that they would resist the attack. Now the French had reconnaissance photographs of German railroad construction and the French should have known the attack was coming by the fact that you had a large uh, buildup of, uh, of railroad infrastructure near the French front line. French officers and men were executed without due process for withdrawals from the front line. And Pétain justified this, quote, pour encourager les autres, close quote. So you can see here the maneuvering the Germans underwent in order to capture Fort Douaumont. And you can see a painting of the French fighting um, during the Battle of Verdun. And you can see inside a contemporary uh, picture of the inside of Fort Douaumont that is there uh, today. On February 28th, the French artillery was increased from 164 to 335, and it inflicted losses on the advancing Germans. And it brought their advance to a standstill. And you can see in these pictures a German mortar on the right, French artillery on the top left, and French soldiers marching to the front. On February 29th, the Germans and the French deployed air units that began fighting over the sky. The aircraft were used for reconnaissance to pinpoint targets for artillery, and so the fighter aircraft were sent up to shoot down those aircraft, and so the fighter aircraft ended up fighting with each other to try to get command of the air. You can see here a German observation balloon that would have been sent up to communicate via a phone line to direct the artillery. You've got U.S. volunteer pilots who flew at Verdun in the top right, and you've got a French anti-aircraft gun on the top left. 
On March 31st, 6,000 French trucks a day were organized to travel to Verdun, bringing artillery and supplies and soldiers to bolster the front. Here you can see the French trucks driving on the Voie Sacrée, as it came to be known, which the Germans shelled incessantly. And you can see a horse on the bottom left pulling uh, munitions and in the painting and the photographs, the movement of those early trucks along that road. By April 30th, the body count of both killed and wounded reached 133,000 French and 120,000 Germans. 4,000 guns were deployed of all sizes uh, from both sides, which was then the largest concentration of artillery to that point in history. By April 30th, the body count had reached 133,000 French dead and 120,000 dead Germans. 4,000 guns were deployed from both sides, which is greater even than the earlier record-breaking concentration of artillery. On June 7th, the French surrendered Fort Vaux. The French lost 100 casualties and they inflicted 2,700 casualties on the Germans who were fighting in the tunnels underground in Fort Vaux. An incredible, brutal fight. Again here you can see an, a, lay, a, a layout of the uh, Fort Vaux and you can see a picture outside of um, Fort Vaux and, you, and again you can see the incredible destruction uh, indicated in an aerial photograph of the shelling of Fort Vaux. On June 11th the French were losing. The French were outnumbered two to one by German artillery and they were losing air superiority. They requested a desperate offensive from their British allies to the north in the Flanders. On June 22nd, the Germans used phosgene gas for the first time in order to capture Fort Souville. And this was important because being a gas, the molecules were much smaller and it mimics oxygen. So people would breathe it in. It would replace the oxygen in the bloodstream and people would die of, of oxygen deprivation. And most importantly, it could penetrate the carbon filter of gas masks. And it was used against German, against French artillery and the artillery uh, artillerists would be gassed and were unable to operate their artillery. So it was an efficient way of stopping French artillery fire support. On June 23rd, 30,000 Germans advanced along a three mile front after an artillery and phosgene gas bombardment. And they came within 2.5 miles of Verdun, four kilometers, and got within 1,200 yards from a ridge overlooking the city. This was the high point of the battle. A week later, on July 1st, the British held a diversionary attack at the Somme to take the pressure off the French. The Germans withdrew some of their forces from the Somme, uh, uh, to the Somme from Verdun as a response. On July 14th, the body count was 275,000 French casualties, including 70,000 dead, and the Germans had 250,000 casualties. On July 31st, at the Somme, the British and German casualties each totaled 160,000 soldiers each for a total of 320,000. On October 22nd, the French achieved artillery superiority. You had 600 large French guns against 500 large German guns. The French provoked a German counter battery attack in which the French used it to attack the German guns. In other words, the French fired some guns, the Germans responded, and then the French used it to zero in on the German guns, and they destroyed 400 of the 500 guns. So the, the French were demonstrating their technical efficiency. On October 23rd to 24th, following hits by super French artillery, this is the very large railroad artillery, the Germans evacuated Fort Duemont, and the French advanced, capturing 6,000 German soldiers. On November 2nd uh, to 3rd, the Germans abandoned Fort Vaux after five days of French bombardment and a French assault to reoccupy it. On November 19th, after a series of offensives, the Battle of the Somme concludes between the English and the Germans. The casualties were 660,000 Germans and 630,000 French and English. On December 22nd, the Battle of Verdun concluded. The French suffered 377 1,231 casualties and the Germans suffered 337,000 casualties. 
The total dead for both sides was estimated at 420,000, half a million dead. Here you can see the view from Fort Duamo, and you can see here a French soldier having recaptured Fort Vaux. So what were the results of the Battle of Verdun and the Battle of the Somme? 48 German divisions rotated through Verdun, the majority on the Western Front, and at least 66 divisions, or over 75% of the French army, had at one point rotated through Verdun. Famous soldiers who had served there included uh, Heinz Guderian, Erich von Manstein, uh, von Paulus, Klug, uh, Keitel, von Brausich, uh, Ernst Rahm, Rudolf Hess, uh, Pétain, Charles de Gaulle, uh, Lettre de, de uh, Tassigny, who planned the uh, Dien Bien Phu operation. Falkenhayn died believing, wrongly, that Germany had only lost a single soldier for every two lost by the French. So this was his goal, this was his calculus, to create an attrition field where for every dead German soldier, two French would die and then France would eventually collapse. However, he was wrong. He had no way of calculating the losses inflicted reliably. And the estimate he did make was incorrect. His first error was he underestimated the quality of the French soldiers. And two, he never communicated the methods of attrition strategy to his subordinates. So they ended up continuing to think that they were going to optimize to capture Verdun and not simply inflict losses on the French. So if you take a look at the grand total of losses, the Somme and the Battle of Verdun, you have 997,000 Germans suffering both death and injury, and 1,007,231 losses on the English and French side, for a grand total of more than 2 million casualties. And a lot of these injured um, were chronic. Uh, it was a, a battle that drew in people from the English and the French empires. Uh, in, in fact, one peculiar statistic more Arab Muslims and Jews died at the Battle of Verdun than in any Arab-Israeli war except the Foundation of Israel. Uh, you had uh, soldiers serving from as far as Afghanistan and India and uh, French colonial troops from Indochina, like Vietnam and Algeria and from the colonies of Africa. Uh, it was uh, really the clash of empires. And uh, it was... Um, uh, an, an incredibly large battle that uh, w was not expected that the French uh, would win. German morale proved professionally resilient, but nevertheless was fading. French morale was unexpectedly and remarkably resilient, and it possibly had to do with the fact that the French uh, political system and its society was more mature, more democratic, and less deferential. And so French soldiers took more personal responsibility for participating in a battle. This is a battle where soldiers went into the battlefield and disappeared in enormous numbers. And the French made this sacrifice to maintain the independence of their country. And to show you the desperation uh, of the French. Let's take a look at the demographics they were facing against. So this is France and Russia at the time of uh, around 1848. So this is before German unification. Uh, you've got 36 million French and about 32.5 million Germans and Prussians and other minor states. And you've got about 70 million people in the Russian Empire. So France at this time, uh, and shortly after at the Battle of Crimea, was the leading army uh, in Europe. And this is the post-Napoleonic period where France was much more moderate. And so it played a positive, constructive role and states deferred to it. In 1871, France was defeated by the Prussians in the Franco-Prussian War. At the Battle of Sedan, Napoleon III was captured, his army was defeated, and the, the Prussians marched and put Paris to siege and the French surrendered. 
Here you have the French population of 36 million, which is approximately the same it was a generation earlier, and Germany's now got 41 million, and the Russians have inched from 70 to 90 million. Here we have 1910, four years before the breakout of World War I. The French population has not increased much. It's around 39 million. The Germans had an explosive increase in their population because of the very large rural families. And look at Russia. It went from 90 to 170. So while the French were horrified at the size of the German army, made possible by the huge size of the German population, the Germans themselves were terrified by the very large army and the very large population in Russia. The French fought at Verdun, outnumbered, uh, by a German army that was 50% larger. And not wanting to suffer the same defeat in 1871, not wanting to bow to German militarism, not wanting to give up more provinces, they fought with a brutal aggressiveness at Verdun that ultimately led them uh, to be the victor. But psychologically, the losses were so significant, the, Ger the French lost more than a million soldiers during the First World War, that it might have played a role in their willingness to resist um, a generation later in World War II. One of your assignments is to uh, play through the simulation close combat modern tactics and then uh, to do a report on it. Uh, the assignment is posted on the Moodle site. So to access the actual close combat software, it's going to be in the lab in H923C in the hall building. That's the ninth floor. And uh, what follows this is a tutorial on how to use that software. Gazwa op order situation. Gazwa, the symbolic capital of the rebellious clans, stands now alone, defiant till the end. He who controls Gazwa shall rule the land, quotes the ancient texts, and it is within Gazwa that the final battle for control of this torn and blood, bloodied land shall be fought. The future of this land rests with you. The hour of reckoning is at hand. Mission. Take control of Gazwa. Execution. Admin and Logistics, SOP. Command and Signals, SOP. The situation, mission, execution, admin orders, and command and signals is the standard format of orders for NATO. Whenever anyone gives an order, this is the format they use. These are the forces that are available. You can uh, click on it and it'll tell you what weapons they have. That's a assault rifle. Tank grenade, <coughs> anti personnel grenade, rocket launcher, machine gun, assault rifle, machine gun. And you can look at the vehicles, it shows you how many people there are. Green means experienced, orange is less experienced. Here's a grenade launcher team. Here's an M1 Abrams tank, the main gun. Smoke. grenades. So this is the uh, map of the city. The lit area is where you can deploy and the rest of the area is either neutral or enemy territory. We click next. Let me get rid of this in the middle. All right, so this is the uh, battlefield. Um, in the bottom left, you've got a minus sign which allows you to zoom out. So this is the entire map. Uh, you can see these red stars and uh, sometimes the red star and half of it is sort of this whitish green star. 
Your mission is to occupy all of these red stars uh, and convert them into green stars and to occupy these half green stars and red stars and convert them into green stars. So all of these stars you have to physically approach and occupy. Now some of them are inside buildings which means vehicles can't go there so you're going to have to get your infantry to walk over there. These blue symbols are your soldiers. There are no red symbols that are currently visible but they would indicate the enemy. Uh, your weapon systems are basically American and the the enemies are basically uh, Soviet uh, type of uh, ordnance. There are various symbols here that are standard NATO symbology and if you're not sure what they mean you can zoom in by pressing the plus and you can zoom in more closely and you'll see vehicles and soldiers. So you have an options button and this thing lets you uh, take away trees if they're in the way, um, rem removes the dead soldiers. Here we have a choice of different indicators for the soldiers. I like to use cohesion for the team info icons display and suppression for the individual soldiers. Um, there's other issues, basically the screen resolution, that's going to be fixed on the computer you're using. And op for what language they'll be screaming at you in. In this particular case, they'll be screaming Russian. But you can put English, and then you can understand what the hell they're screaming about when they're uh, shooting at you. So we have, at first, we've got this little map, which is the large map. And I like to, I like to have that map on the side, because when the enemy shows up, they show up as red dots. So you put it off in the corner somewhere where it doesn't bother, bother you. And when you click on it, it allows you to sort of zoom around in it. Another useful little chart, which I put right underneath it, indicates uh, the soldiers in one of the uh, units. So I'm going to click on this armored vehicle, this M2A3 Bradley Infantry Fighting, fighting Vehicle. It shows that there are three individuals. Uh, they're called Mason, Danning, and Goff. And it says they're ambushing, which means they're basically hiding. And here's their, um, what looks like a cannon with 4,200 rounds. And it's uh, you got the commander there. Uh, the, the gunner's got this rocket system with 12 rounds, and the driver drives, uh, but he's also got a smoke system. Uh, if we click on these groups of soldiers here, this is a fire team. They've got a sniper rifle, a machine gun, an assault rifle with a grenade launcher, and two assault rifles. And it says they're all ambushing, and it gives you how many bullets they have, and it tells you that they're healthy. And it gives you their names, and uh, what, you know, this is the team leader, the squad leader, the rifleman, the assistant to the rifleman, and the rifleman. So these are your guys. So um, we have here a begin button, uh, which we're not going to click on until we're ready. Uh, this is the countdown, so it's going to automatically begin if we don't do anything. <clears throat> and uh, it tells you here, these are the, all the different units you have. You have a total of 15, uh, th uh, five columns of three. And it tells you what they're doing. And if you click over it, you've got um, the number of soldiers there. And you've got this anti-personnel and anti-tank display. Uh, and it tells you green means strong, yellow means not so strong, and red is weak. And it, it shows you the distance in meters. So the farther you are, the more likely you are to be red. And, and this is a measure of how effective you are against anti-personnel and against anti-tank. Um, so infantry tend to be less efficient against anti-tank because some of them don't have any anti-tank weapons at all. Others have um, uh, various types of shoulder-launched weapons. So what can we do with these guys? Well, what we want to do is deploy them so that we can move out and capture objectives. So I'm going to take these vehicles. This is an infantry fighting vehicle. It's got a, a can an auto cannon and an anti-tank rocket. I'm going to deploy that over here because I want to be able to have it go north. So these are, what you do is you click on it and then you right click and you can give it various orders. I can give it a move order and just click a spot there and it'll move um, in, a, in a reasonably slow fashion there. I can tell it to move fast at which point it's going to drive very quickly. For soldiers it means they're going to sprint where if, if they have just a move command they're going to be a lot more attentive. This is move covertly which is basically sneak along. For a vehicle it's not very useful but for infantry it allows them to crawl. Uh, this is fire. I mean, it'll tell you to fire on a particular location. It can fire very far. Um, uh, now, here you can see that there's going to be a, a green band, which means you can hit something, and a red band, which means you cannot. And if there's an enemy uh, in a location, don't shoot at your own guys. It, it'll actually will shoot at them. If you click on an enemy that you've identified, 
um, it'll put out a large target circle to confirm it, and then this will follow the enemy as it moves around. Uh, if, on the other hand, you want to put a hole in a building, you just uh, put this red dot there, and it'll uh, orange dot, and it'll blast its way through the wall. So you can shoot at locations if you think there's an enemy there and you're not sure. Uh, you can also have it fire smoke. Um, and you know, if it's green, it can hit it, hit the smoke. But once it gets black, it means it can't fire the smoke there. So it's got small smoke canisters. Uh, you've got a defend function, which you can orient in different directions, and it'll orient the vehicle. So you know, the frontal armor of the vehicle is strongest, and so you orient it this way. The vehicle will maneuver to have the frontal armor aiming in a particular direction. If you put ambush, it means it's going to face in a particular direction, but it, it's it's going to shoot only when the enemy is very close. Um, and then you can mount and dismount soldiers on a vehicle, which is a good thing to do. And you can tell it to dig. Obviously, vehicles cannot dig, but people can dig. And you can have soldiers run over and then mount, for example, this vehicle. And if the vehicle can carry the soldiers, like the M3 can, but the M1 Abrams tank cannot, uh, they'll be able to mount. And they'll disappear inside the vehicle. The vehicle will have a symbol, and you can drive much more quickly. So the key essentially here is we've got to move and occupy those locations and we don't want to die. And so we want to have armored vehicles in support because they're powerful and strong, but they can't see very well. So let's go deploy the armored vehicles. I'm putting a tank here, M1 tank. I'm going to move it later. I'm going to orient it looking down the street. I've got my Bradley looking north. I've got my striker, which is a vehicle, a real vehicle with a large cannon. I'm going to have it looking up here. I've got another Bradley, which I'm going to put here to drive north. I've got here a striker with a machine gun on it. So I'm going to put that over here. Uh, yeah, I'm going to put that here. I've got here a vehicle with a grenade launcher. I'm going to have that driving through the compound here. This is a typical Middle Eastern town with high adobe walls around each of the... Uh, uh, buildings for the compound. I'm going to put this armor vehicle behind. You don't want to cluster your armor vehicles because if the enemy's got mortar artillery, they're going to bring artillery, and if your forces are clustered, uh, they're going to get hit. So the numbers here are the uh, stories of the buildings. I've got here uh, groups of soldiers who can see what's going on, and they're going to accompany the armored vehicles to give overwatch. So it's sort of a mutual cooperation. The infantry see well. Now what you can do is, I'm going to have these guys, I'm going to press the shift button down, so they're going to go over this location, and then to this location, and then run over to this location. So they're going to dash between the buildings um, and pick up those various sites. I'm going to put these uh, infantiers here, I'm going to orient them around by doing the defense function, rotate it this way, so they're looking this way. I'm going to have them jump over the wall and occupy these buildings. Now I know there's no enemy immediately near the vehicles, uh, so I'm, I'm safe for a short distance. So I'm going to have these guys run all the way across here to the second story building. I'm going to have these guys run across two buildings to, get to the top of that building. Uh, let's see, i got these guys here. I'm going to have them work with the tank. I'm going to rotate them around and they're going to run as well. And these guys are all going fast initially. Later I'm going to have them going much more carefully. But I want to get a get the jump on the enemy um, by occupying some key locations very very quickly before the enemy um, uh, locates them. The computer typically is a bit more cautious than I am. All right, so we're all ready. We can see uh, we've got defending groups and moving groups uh, all working together. So I'm having the infantry move quickly, and the armor is going to wait. So let's get started. Boom. All right, we're in action. I check up here. I see no red dots, so we've not sighted any enemy. So I'm going to get my armor to get moving. I'm moving my uh, grenade launcher vehicle here. I'm going to have my striker move right up to the edge of the road. I don't want it to cross because I don't know if there's a Soviet vehicle beyond it. I am going to put my tank in the middle of the road. Because, secured. Uh, there we go. So it means it's occupied. Yes, yeah, so these soldiers have occupied that flag. I'm putting my Bradley vehicle up here. And I'm driving this uh, Bradley vehicle through here as well. So I'm going to keep an eye out because I'm anticipating uh, encountering some of these uh, op four or enemy force hiding somewhere. I'm going to bring this uh, machine gun vehicle up here. So as these vehicle vehicles cross over the corners, you got to be ready to get your vehicles to react and bring fire on the target. I'm later going to get helicopter air support and a mortar barrage from an artillery battery, and I'm going to bring those in um, 
when I see a useful target. My, my goal is not to destroy the enemies, to occupy real estate. Okay, so I've arrived here at the intersection. Position established. Thank you. Watching and waiting. Watching and waiting. Thank you. So I've got these guys ready here. I've made the... Oh, there we go. we got a BMP up here. All right, so uh, you can see it up here. we got red indicators. So I want to zoom out and see what they are. I see that they're two armored vehicles because I recognize the symbology. And they're here. So, all righty. I want to engage these guys. Okay, he can see him. All right, so I, I gave the order. And both Bradleys are engaging this vehicle at long distance. They've got rockets. The BMP's fairly strong. All right, I got my M1 Abrams coming in here, but it's not going to be able to react in time. So I've got two... two <laughs> All right, I just got a hit from another BMP up here. My... Yeah, it just blew up my uh, Bradley. So I'm going to have my Bradley engage the BMP here. And I'm going to quickly bring in my Abrams tank, which is strong. I'm going to have it drive up here and deal with the problem. So I was a bit too aggressive here. Now I've got a crew. Uh, I need the crew to go save themselves. So I'm going to advise that they go run themselves into this building. I'm going to get the brass orientation so the frontal armor is strong. All right, my striker. Uh, my striker's got a wounded individual here. I don't know why. Uh, I think so. Yes, yeah, so they brought in artillery. That's an explosion there. So I'm going to tell these guys to not run to that location. I don't want them to run into the artillery. I am going to run into the oh, wow. Look, I've got a lot of targets here. Okay, so it's bring the BMP there. So, boom. And I'm going to have the M M1 Abrams continue until it's engaged and destroyed. <laughs> Alright, so that's my um, Bradley firing a rocket at the BMP-3. What you want to do is, of course, achieve a rocket. So that's good revenge. Alright, so we have another vehicle that's been spotted. Mm, obviously, it doesn't... Uh, it's probably been spotted by the infantry in the building. This Bradley. And the Bradley, oh, they have a rocket they can fire. So they're firing a shoulder launch rocket. I'm going to bring the Bradley around here to try to deal with this vehicle before it falls out of sight. So here I've got my M1 Abrams. I'm going to slow it down so it's got a better chance of hitting the target. Uh, the BMP has been destroyed here. This BMP has been destroyed. Um, now you got to watch out. There's infantry in the area probably, and they can fire anti-tank rounds at the... Uh, are fire capable. All right, so this, I've got my mortars, my rotary, and my fixed-wing aircraft. I want to save it. I want to save it. Um, so, yeah, so by infantry, they fired a rocket, and they missed at this vehicle, and... The missile can't penetrate. Yeah, they have a missile. So I'm going to have them go into ambush mode, because I don't want them to be seen. But I want them to observe what they can and then to report back. All right, so I've got the uh, uh, Bradley is coming in. Watching and waiting. Right. It doesn't quite have the angle on the building, uh, but I want to get the BMP. So I'm going to drive around uh, to the front entrance here. Okay, so i got to get back to these other guys. Uh, I'm going to have these guys run across the street here. I still don't think there's an enemy nearby, so I think I have a decent chance of uh, covering the real estate. Uh, the there. artillery... Is no longer bothering these guys. So I have these guys, and these guys are doing Overwatch. They're basically looking at what the enemy is doing. All right, so I've neglected the people down here. All right, armored vehicle. I'm going to tell it to go through to the other side here, and to see what it can see. And the striker. I'm going to get it to drive over here. And I've got this striker. Also, I'm going to have it drive right across to here, and I'm going to get this vehicle to drive in. Here to command this. Okay, so uh, that's the M1 Abrams. Yeah, it's destroyed the M113 in the process. Okay, so I've got my Bradley, which I'm going to bring in here, and it's going to uh, engage this BMP2. I'm going to bring my uh, M1 Abrams in closer. It, need, it should really have infantry support. Um, where it is, is a little bit vulnerable. Um, Alright, so the BMP is, is being a little bit 
bold. Alright, that was an artillery there. round. I don't know where the artillery round came from or went to. So that's a little bit peculiar. Alright, so this guy is hiding around the building. Should I, you know, do I want to charge him or not? I think, you know, I think at the moment I want to wait because I have other opportunities to destroy that target. All right, so I've got my fire team here. Watching and waiting. Uh, they've already crossed a significant part. Yeah, so you know they're gonna cross. They're gonna go all the way over here to get a, to get eyes on the uh, this town, this golden shrine, which we're gonna want to occupy. And these guys are here. I'm gonna have them run right across this building. I mean, normally this is quite risky running openly like this in an urban environment, but. Uh, all right, so we've got this target here. What is this target? All right, that's the same BMP that we saw before. So let's, uh, there. you know, let's call in an airstrike and see what that does. And if it doesn't work, then we're going to get. Uh, so I have here a rotary, a fixed wing, air, uh, yeah, rotary wing aircraft. That's a helicopter. There so helicopters will come in and conduct a strike on this BMP two. So we lay yellow smoke, and, and then we uh, we hope that the helicopter, when it flies We're by, there. conducts an effective airstrike. Let's see what happens. All right, my striker's uh, deployed. I'm going to have it drive to the other side here to see what it can see. And my striker CV, I'm going to have it going up the road behind. Oh, there we go. There's the helicopter. All right, let's see. All right, you can see some infantry in the nearby building. It hit the BMP, which is uh, fairly lucky because uh, most of the time it doesn't. So that BMP is taken care of. So I'm going to drive this Bradley into the open compound, and hopefully uh, it will interdict any infantry that's running around. This tells me that there's infantry in that building, so I'm going to have this uh, M1 tank fire a couple of rounds into the building and demolish it. It's a powerful 125mm gun. It'll so you got some more people there. So you know what? I feel like I'm going to blow up more of the building. This is not getting that collateral damage by shooting the crap out of the buildings is not considered uh, a good long-term strategy. Yes, yeah, so these are the crew that were killed. So we're going to around. Now it's firing machine guns as well. Alrighty, so we got the striker here. Da, 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 da. I'm going to bring it onto the road. Let's see, it. yeah, the M1 uh, hit Position the building again. It doesn't seem to. Uh, you know, if you hear screaming, then uh, it might indicate that uh, the people are not entirely. Alright, cannon fire. Let's sort of move the cannon fire around. Move it to there. Alright, so. I've got my uh, AG, uh, my seven, AG 17, or rather my mortar, my uh, uh, grenade launcher team moving in there. And these guys have occupied this building. And yeah, the other location's quite far away. So this is very, very foolhardy, but I'm having them wander through the back street without armored support. I'm sort of doing it on their own. Not very. <laughs> Oh, there we go. We're we got the there. 272 tank. That's pretty bloody dangerous. So I'm going to stop my blowing up the building arbitrarily. I'm going to first call in a fixed wing airstrike, an, an airplane strike on this. I suspect there's uh, infantry probably nearby, so I'm going to bring a mortar barrage right in the middle of this parking lot. Uh, I'm going to have my M1 tank change its orientation in case the, the T-72 comes down this way. You can see the white smoke deployed. All right, I'm going to uh, All right, my striker is burning. Uh, this is because I have a uh, So uh, the T has a T80, which is burning. All right, I see what happened. My striker drove past the compound. I didn't see the T80. The T80 hit the um, my striker. So now the crew is running. The surviving crew is running into a nearby building. And, uh, yeah, that takes care of the T-80. I suspect there's another T-80 somewhere. I'm going to bring the M1 Abrams right here to the front of the compound to be able to supervise it while my infantry can uh, That's too bad. The enemy uh, has offered a ceasefire. Oh, yeah, never accept the enemy ceasefire. But you can look down here. You can see that their morale is red. Ours is blue. And we have 27 minutes left. This is a 30 minutes. So we've only been doing this for two minutes. Um, 
And we've captured a few objectives, but you can see, you know, we've basically got about a third of the map covered. And position um, established. Uh, you basically got to keep advancing without doing as badly as I did. I've lost um, the striker through negligence. I lost my Bradley because I should have had the infantry before. Um, I, you can see artillery, so they're bringing artillery fire down on top of my. Uh, my crew that escaped from the vehicle. Here's a micro day launcher vehicle. So let's zoom out and uh, uh, we'll call it uh, we'll call it uh, quits here. Alrighty, let's see if you can do uh, better than I have so far. All right. Well, when this when this game ultimately ends, uh, but you know what? We'll end it now. We'll go for the truce and we'll see what the results are. You have to be able to get a victory. Uh, on oh look we have a vehicle right here what is that vehicle I'm curious Let's see. Um, this is a yeah it's a, it's a team of soldiers and it looks like my guys in the building are shooting at them so they've caught them out in the open so this is you know the danger of, so I'm gonna have these guys run across to this building and then bring fire over the wall at these guys in the open it's very very dangerous to be caught in the open like this. All right, so I've got my M1 Abrams here. I'm going to have it orient this way. Um, you've got the Russian uh, tank crew who are basically crawling away. I can bring fire on them from the building, from the crew of the, of the vehicle they destroyed. And the infantry are still running around. Okay, so uh, We're there. let's go and, uh, oh, and yeah, so people are getting uh, hurt here. Uh, don't shoot at oil tankers and stuff like that. They will explode, and if anyone's nearby is going to be injured or killed. So let's go uh, accept the truce. All right, so what it tells us here is minor op for victory, which means the enemy won. They won because they have more of these stars. The battle ended because both sides agreed to a ceasefire. My cohesion was much better than their cohesion. Uh, both sides still control some victory locations. Um, my score is three, theirs is five. So... Um, what you want to do is screen capture this, uh, paste it onto your report, and um, uh, write up uh, the report according to the assignment. And that's um, basically uh, what you need to do. Uh, here's the detail. It gives you the number of killed, incapacitated, and prisoner. Um, so you can sort of focus on it. And this is the army. It actually gives you a breakdown for each of your organizations. Uh, who shot who, uh, an acts of bravery, um, uh, did they get hurt or killed in the process, yeah, these people were all uh, injured. Um, yeah, amazingly, I suffered injuries, but no deaths. That is a miracle. And you can look at Op 4 as well, you can look at the enemy force and see what they've suffered. And they've suffered, the white, the white uh, symbols are tombstones. And yeah, they've suffered quite a few deaths. So I inflicted a fair bit of damage on them. But they won because uh, they still held the uh, real estate, which is very important.